I welcome Professor Hans-Martin Henning. You are Deputy Director of the Fraunhofer Institute of Solar Energy Systems in Freiburg, Germany, and you had the Division of Solar Thermal and Optics in this institute. Um, I think your institute played a very leading role in uh, developing a computer model to analyze the whole energy system of Europe, uh, of Germany, um, including all the sectors as well as all technologies. How can these simulations help us to find a way to the decarbonization future of Germany and what are its limitations? Um, I think we have to understand that uh, our energy system is complex and is even getting more complex. So in the past what happened is that we installed renewable energies in wind, solar and so forth in our countries but now we come to a limit where we cannot just continue installing them without affecting the overall system. So what we now need is a real system integration. We have increasingly hours where we have more electricity than needed in that moment. Uh, and then we have to manage that. So the system is getting more complex in its dynamics and also the different sectors of the, inter, uh, of the energy system uh, have more interactions, uh, are getting more um, effects where they affect each other. So, for instance, uh, electricity is playing an increasing role also in the heating sector, which helps both renewables to find new um, loads, new um, sectors where electricity can be used if there is a lot of electricity, but it also helps to decarbonize the heat sector. That's just one example. The same is true for mobility. In order to handle this complexity, we need to understand the interdependence of all the different technologies of all the different end use sectors. And here, models like the one which we have developed definitely can help. You ask also for the limitations of these models. Yes, of course, a model can, ha, has always a limited scope. For instance, in our model, we have no disaggregation in a spatial level. So Germany is just considered as a single node, and that's obviously a limit. So the model cannot help us to understand the trade-off, for instance, between grid expansion and installing storage. Uh, in order to do that, we really need a model which also has spatially resolved, uh, resolved uh, scope. That's one so, of the limitations, so. but, uh, and, and certainly there are others. Nevertheless, I think also the response to our publication shows us that it helps a lot to understand and get a more transparent idea of the transformation of the energy system and uh, dealing with a highly dynamic and complex uh, system. Uh, you look at uh, the next uh, 35 years and you look at uh, all technologies or renewables and we have a lot. What are the key pillars for your 80% scenarios in terms of renewable technologies which you need? So definitely key pillars, at least under the conditions in Germany, are uh, solar photovoltaics, are wind energy, but also uh, solar thermal uh, energy conversion plays a role in the heat sector for space heating, for hot water, also for low temperature uh, process heat. And an important pillar is biomass. We have a limited potential of biomass, but biomass has the big advantage that it's not volatile. It can be used when we have not enough of the other renewables, and so also biomass plays an important role. Which storages are relevant? And also storage becomes relevant, much more relevant than it is today. Uh, and that's, again, storage in the heat sector. Heat storage is quite cheap, quite available. Water as a storage medium is, has a lot of advantages. Um, so heat storage can help, at least in the first step, 
but then also electricity storage becomes important. Of course, batteries, and we see uh, tremendous developments here regarding uh, cost, but also energy density, power density. Uh, also, pumped hydro can play an important role. In Germany, the potential is limited, but if we look at Europe, there are places where we have a big potential for that. And in the long term, it's obvious that to come to a decarbonization of 80% and more, we also need long-term storage. And long-term storage typically are synthetic chemical energy carriers produced with renewable electricity that can be hydrogen, it can be methane, it can be different liquids like methanol or other uh, liquid uh, hydrocarbons which are produced with renewable electricity. You, you said you predict a complex system for the next 35 years, like a forecast. What makes you so certain that this will come true? Oh, this is uh, probably um, kind of a misunderstanding. Of course, we make an extrapolation and uh, try to make a, draw a picture of the future, but it, we are not saying this will happen, this is going to happen. The so what are your key messages to politicians? What uh, has to be done as better frame conditions to reach the 80% uh, decarbonization? Um, this model uh, provides a techno-economic optimization of the entire system. What it does not provide is uh, a market design to uh, provide microeconomic uh, business models uh, to really um, uh, create the investments needed. So I think what politicians can learn from that is how, in a big picture, the development should look like. But, and then they have to translate this into a design of the market uh, for the future to enable investments, enable actions in the economic uh, area uh, to drive an, a development towards this uh, macroeconomic um, picture. So just to give some examples, what is very obvious from this analysis is that we have a much more flexible energy system in future. And to activate storage, to activate um, investments into demand side management or demand response, load shifting, we need flexible energy tariffs. Today, electricity price is just stable every hour of the year the same. Uh, but if, in order to stimulate that we shift our loads or we operate a storage, we need flexible tariffs. So we can charge the storage when energy is cheap and we can discharge it if energy is uh, more expensive. That's just one, one thing which we can learn from the results of that model. Another one is that uh, we need a lot of infrastructures which should not just be paid according to the... Uh, the price for these infrastructures should not put on the price for electricity, but on the power, uh, the maximum power consumed. Because the grid has to cover at le the, the, the maximum uh, uh, um, power uh, situation. And so we need different tariff structures which are more in line with the needed uh, developments. Okay, thank you very much and good luck for your work. Thank you.